Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We from Group One. We want to present about a particular base nano composite, which is nano clay. So I will pass the next presenter. Okay, so th today I'm going to talk about what is exactly nanoclays. Nanoclays are made from nano particles of layered mineral silicates. Nanoclays can be organized with some classes such as montmorillonite, bentonite, kaolinite, hectorite, and halosite. Organically modified nanoclays are known as argonoclays. It is an attractive class of hybrid organic inorganic nanomaterials that have potential use in polymer such as rheological modifiers, gas absorbance and drug delivery carriers. As you can see here, in this white particle, this is nanoclay that is being widely sell in India. Okay, for the next slide, I'm going to talk about example of nanoclays. We can take Montmorillonite nanoclays as our nearest example because it is used in material application. Montmorillonite is only one nanometer thick of aluminum Aluminum silicate layers the surface of which can be substituted with metal cations and stacked in multi-layer stacks with a size of 10 micrometer. Other surface modification of the clay layers, Montmorillonite, can be dispersed in a polymer matrix to form a polymer clay nanocomposite. In figure above, here we can see that it contains about individual nanometer thick clay layers and can be completely separate to form platelet-like nanoparticles with a very high aspect ratio, nanometer multiple with micrometer. So for the next example, I will pass to Mukris. Okay, the next example. The second example is... Uh, the second example is a uh, hal halocyte nanoclay. This halocyte is uh, naturally occurring of the two-layered aluminosilicate with a tube structure which being called uh, aluminosilicate nanotube. And we can see the external surface, this is we call uh, uh, holocyte uh, nano, nanotube. Uh, the external surface, we can see that uh, this nanotube had a chemical properties of silicon oxide. And the internal surface, internal uh, cylinder core have uh, chemical properties of aluminum oxide, Al3O2. And these two layer halocyte tubes are chemically similar to kaolin. And it have an average of dimension of 15 uh, times 1,000 nanometer, uh, which is comparable to carbon nanotubes. Why is it comparable to carbon nanotubes? Because uh, it can grow into a long multi walled tubules which uh, resemble to the multi walled uh, same as carbon nanotubes. And next, uh, the structure, the structure of halocyte nanotubes are hollow and it can be used for control drug delivery and release, rheology modification, and then a composite application. And the chemical composition of the physical properties of halocyte nanoclay may be effective in enhancing the use of cement composite. That's all, and I pass to Tillman. Next, uh, I want to talk about the structure of clay particles. So uh, the physical properties of clay are more important in defining uh, the various clay groups then the well-established particle of using the chemical behavior of the material to evaluate material performance. So usually, uh, clay particles is size about 2 microns. So if nanoclays is much smaller than 2 microns. So, uh, and clay is, <coughs> is the fine particles, eh, the most fine particles from all soil particles. So, uh, so uh, the clay particles is formed uh, 
uh, with usually the common two types of structural layers such as tetrahedral and octahedral and for each layer the silicon oxygen of tetrahedra share the corners to connect the adjacent tetrahedra from the tetrahedron and it is resulting uh, the hexagonal lattice in clay particles so we can see here uh, there is a tetrahedral and octahedral unit which is supposedly uh, we can found in clay particle so I will pass to the next presenter which is Amani so for the application of nanoclay, uh, nanoclay have various uh, applications in many fields. We can use it for pharmacies and medicine, or for uh, pro uh, problematic soil treatment, or cosmetic, or even in paint. As you can see, for example, we can, uh, we can use it as a fire protection for plastic. We can use it also in paint, which when you add a little amount of uh, nanoclay, it can actually enhance the properties of the color. That's why you also use it in uh, cosmetic, for example, for the eyeshadow or for the lipstick. We can also use it as a cat litter. Uh, when you buy the cat litter, you can actually, you know, like the good quality one, you can see it from the back, it's made of 100% of clay, which you can also use it not for cats, but also for your plants. Uh, it's also uh, f uh, it's application for bone uh, cement, uh, but most important application, which we will talk in more details, are uh, in, uh, <coughs> in food packaging and uh, to fertilize the desert sand. Okay, based on what has been said by Amani just now, uh, the nanoclays can be used for food packaging and I will give the explanation about the advantages of nanoclays in promising property attention in organic polymers as food packaging. The incorporation of nanoclays will improve the thermal, mechanical and barrier properties over a number compound. Examination uh, with the alternative nanofillers like nanooxide, carbonate and crystalline polysaccharide Nanoclay shows the identical and higher performance and showed that the nanoclays when be mixing over a gelatin compound, it shows the higher and identical performance and whereas various properties and water solubility were equally improved. Uh, moreover, the nanoclays were comparatively cheap and affordable to be used as a purposeful material for packaging. And the addition of a tiny low quantity of nanoclays will improve the polymer's barrier, thermal, mechanical, and degradation properties. I will pass to the next presenter. Okay, as for the dirt fertilizer, the problem is with the desert sand, it's not because it doesn't have enough nutrients or water. Believe it or not, the desert sand actually have all the necessary uh, nutrients to actually grow the plant. The only problem is uh, for the sand, uh, it just doesn't have, uh, it uh, doesn't have the ability to retain water. That's why we, uh, we actually use the nanoclay. Uh, we mix a specific amount of nanoclay, which it's, uh, if you add too little, it's not going to be any impact. Or if you put uh, too much, it's going to be uh, turned into a barrier between the sand and the water. So using specific amount of nanoclay with, uh, uh, with water, which we can have uh, liquid nanoclay. So when we separate around uh, the sand of the desert, when it sucks in, it's going to be attached to the particle of the sand, which, would, uh, which will give it the enough uh, water and nutrients to actually grow the plant. Uh, this method is actually, it's not new, and we've been using it uh, through many years. But the problem is uh, the old technique, it actually needs a very long time to actually uh, transfer the desert sand into, uh, 
uh, fertilized soil, uh, soil. That's why, uh, for example, it took 15 years uh, to transfer a desert sand into a fertilized soil in Egypt. But with this new te uh, technique, we only need uh, seven hours to actually transfer this uh, sand into a fertilized soil. Uh, also, it doesn't, uh, it's completely free from any chemical, and we can actually reduce the water by uh, 60%, because it lasts uh, five years. And um, this is the end of our presentation uh, of group one of nanoclay. So, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, we are from group two. So, first and foremost, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Wan Fazli to give us an opportunity to teach uh, all of you, uh, my friends, about nanocarbon. So, the topic is fiber based nanocomposite, nanocarbon. So, what is nanocarbon actually? So, nanocarbon is a term where a composite or a carbon compound with at least its dimension is under is smaller than 100 nanometers so talking about talking about um, dimensions we have three dimensions which is first one is this we call it three uh, nanoscale dimension and the second one is this this is we call two nanoscale dimension, and the next one is a bit like this. If I remember, it's a little bit solid like that. So this is we call it nanoparticles, which the three nanoscale dimension, and this is the two nanoscale dimensions, which is nanofiber, which is nanocarbon, for example, and this is the uh, one one nanoscale dimension. We call it nano nanoclay so that is the brief for nanocarbon so nanocarbon its properties is it has special mechanic and electrical and thermal properties due to their small size and high surface area to volume ratio which uh, dr wan fazli had taught us last week about the uh, high surface and area to volume ratio which cause the particle can move freely uh, in the dimension. So about nanocarbon, you have uh, four, which is graphene, nanotubes, full arenes, and in full arenes we have C60 and C70, and the last one is nanodiamonds. So I will move to graphene. So about graphene, graphene is a composed of pure carbon as a single sheet in a flat hexagon pattern like this. Uh, can you see the picture here? So, so this is the uh, example of how graphene from this flat surface it can produce to become full arenes and so on. Uh, the next point is each carbon atom in uh, graphene is covalently be, uh, bonded to three other carbons atom with sp2 hybridization uh, like this. You can see there is sp2 hybridization there and it's covalently bonded to three other carbon atoms and the next point is about electrons in graphene do not behave in the same way as in ordinary metals and semiconductors due to the unusual energy momentum relation and basically graphene is simply one atomic layer of graphite so uh, the properties is it has high conductivity. So the useful life of batteries could be increased by 10 times and take less time to charge by using graphene. And graphene is also lightweight. Uh, at one atom tick, it is the thinnest material and lightest material at 0 0.77 milligrams per square meter. And it's also flexible and tough because graphene is extremely flexible, making it mechanically strong. Uh, as I mentioned earlier about the properties, uh, it is mechanically used uh, in, uh, in industry. 
and it can also stretch by 25% of its original length and 200 times stronger than steel and lighter than paper. Uh, paper. <laughs> the last one is about low electrical resistance. So it, it is because the electrical resistance of graphene is among the lowest of any material and you also have high resistance and for example graphene light bulbs uh, use less energy than LED. Uh, I will pass to the next presenter, Nabil. Uh, okay, Assalamualaikum. Uh, next, I will talk about uh, fullness, uh, the second type of nanocarbon. A fullness is an allotrope of carbon that has fused fused rings of five. Two. We have right two seven carbon atoms that are joined by single and double bond to form a close mesh. The chemical, uh, the chemical C60 fullerens called uh, back minister back means fullerene or uh, or bucky balls has 60 has 60 carbon atoms organized in a spherical shape uh, as you can see fullness of c60 and c70 are well known uh, we go to the physical properties for the first Physical properties is that uh, fully runners C60 is uh, able to withstand the high temperature and high pressure. In C60 fully run, the covalent bond that hold the carbon atoms uh, together are extremely powerful and stable. Uh, you know the structure of uh, C60 is like a ball, a ball shape. Yeah, is large and symmetric, which is a uh, it shields the carbon atom inside it because of the structure because of the uh, asymmetric structure uh, it has strong covalent bond it makes that uh, 660 fullerenes are able to withstand uh, strong pressure and strong temperature uh, the bonds uh, between the carbon atom in 660 fullerenes are less likely to break at high temperature because the energy needed to do surpasses the energy provided by the temperature. The 660 fullerenes symmetric structure uh, which holds the carbon atoms together in a rather stable arrangement also helps in preventing the molecule from dissolving. Because the strong covalent bond between the carbon atoms can endure the force of compression. Compression. The 660 fullerenes is also relatively stable at high pressure. The 660 fullerenes symmetric shape also aids in equally distributing compression forces throughout the molecule, increasing to its stability. Next is uh, the second physical properties is that uh, fullerenes are covalent. So they are soluble in organic solvent and insoluble in water. The very strong covalent connections in C60 fullerenes make the molecule stable and resistant to chemical process, which is uh, the covalent bond in C60 fullerenes are also as known as nonpolar. It makes that uh, C60 fullerenes is insoluble in water, but uh, soluble in organic solvent. So the next properties is that uh, based on uh, electronic properties, C60 is a dark purple solid because of the absorption of the UV light and uh, visible region of the ele ele electromagnetic spectrum. When C60 Fullerens, fullerene is dissolved in solvent. It has deep purple color. Uh, however, when the solvent evaporates, C60 fullerens will form a solid precipitate that is brown in color. Uh, for example, uh, graphene and carboxy fullerene are two examples of the oxidation products that can be created when C60 fullerene 
Fluorina is exposed to oxygen in the air. Uh, so, uh, the last part is uh, 660 molecules adopt the FCC arrangement. So, that's all for me. Uh, so, moving on to fluorine C70. Uh, fluorine C70 is a fluorine molecule uh, that consists of 70 carbon atoms. And it is a cage-like fused ring structure with, uh, which resembles a rugby ball. Uh, it's not actually like this, but wait. It's actually like this. Uh, do you guys know the rugby ball, right? Uh, it's made, up, made of uh, 25 pen hexagons and 12 pentagons uh, with uh, carbon atoms at the verticals at of each polygon and bond along each polyg polygon edge. Uh, it contains 37 faces, which is 12 hex hexagons and 12 polygons. So each uh, carbon in the structure uh, is bonded covalently with uh, three, uh, uh, three of the, other, the others. Okay, next is the uh, properties of fluorine C70. Uh, solution state uh, properties of C70, fluorine sparingly soluble in many aromat arom aromatic solvents such as toluene and others like carbon disulfide, uh, but not in water. The solution of C70 is more like reddish brown, like this one. And uh, millimeter size uh, crystals of fluorine C70 can be formed uh, from the solution. So next is the solid uh, fluorine C70. Uh, solid C70 crystallized in monoclinic, hexagonal, rhombohedral, and FCC polymorph at room temperature. The FCC is uh, more stable at 70 degrees Celsius and above. Okay, um, for the last part is the application of fluorine C70. Uh, these uh, can be used as organic uh, photovoltaics. Uh, these are powerful antioxidants which reacts instantly and a great red with free radicals which are mostly a reason for death or cell damage. And the other uses of fluorine C70 is like as a catalyst in water purification and biohazard protection medical and vehicle, and also portable power. Uh, so that's all from me. I'm passing to you. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Noma Izzat Fidaus and I am going to present about carbon nanotubes. So carbon nanotube, uh, OCNT, is a tube made of carbon with uh, diameters typically measured in nanometers. It has cylindrical structure with a nanoscale diameter that is like a rolled graphene sheet. So it's like a graphene, graphene with a layer of graphite. It has been rolled and it has become a carbon nanotube that is like the image, easy image for us to understand. So it only consists of sp2 carbon so sp2 is actually stronger than sp3 so believe it or not carbon nanotubes is actually stronger than diamonds so there are two structural forms of carbon nanotubes so there are multi wall carbon nanotubes and single wall carbon nanotubes okay, so single wall carbon nanotubes it is a special case of carbon materials known as one dimensional material so it's basically just a Roll of uh, a sheets of graphene rolled to form a hollow tube with wall of one atom thick. So, in other words, single wall carbon nanotubes can be described as graphene sheets. Yeah, less uh, just like I said. So, so this single wall carbon nanotubes is actually just the is the thinnest material that we can see. And for multi wall carbon nanotubes, uh, it can viewed as concentric arrangement of single wall carbon nanotubes it consisting of multiple layers of graphene rolled as rolled up seamlessly into a tube shape so it's like a multiple 
layer of graphene, or we can call it as uh, graphite, it's been rolled into uh, a tube shape. So the number of nanotubes that are within multi-wall carbon nanotubes can vary from as little as 3 to over 20. So how does carbon nanotube mean? Uh, there are lots of, uh, there are three actually, uh, uh, methods to uh, make this carbon nanotube, but I think I use carbon vapor deposition because it is widely used and uh, quickly, quick. So firstly, a substrate is prepared with a layer of metal catalyst particles such as nickel, cobalt and iron. Then uh, the substrate is heated to approximately 700 degrees Celsius. And two, gas, two gases are bled into the reactor, a processed gas such as ammonia, nitrogen or hydrogen, and a carbon containing gas like acetylene, ethylene, ethanol, methane. So we usually use ethanol. And the carbon containing gas is broken apart at the surface of the catalyst particle and the carbon is transported to the edge of the particle. So um, the carbon nanotubes will form at the edges of the particle. So, I think that's all from me. I will pass to the next presenter. OK, next uh, is nano diamonds. Nano diamond is a diamond particle with a size in the nanometer range or millionth of millimeter. <coughs> nano diamonds are made of a diamond core and outer layers of amorphous carbon. The shape of diamond particles is either spherical or elliptical. Nano diamonds were produced by igniting explosives in lightly sealed spaces under extreme heat and pressure. Currently, other methods to synthesize, synthesize nanocarbon, nanodiamonds besides explosion are ion or laser bombardment, microwave plasma, <coughs> microwave plasma vapor deposition methods, hydrothermal synthesis, and electrochemical or ultrasound synthesis. So how does it make? <coughs> there are a lot of ways to obtain nano diamonds. It includes the methods that I just talked about. And however, um, detonation synthesis become industry standard because the process is more quick and cheap. But non the nano diamonds aggregate and are varying, varying size and pure. Purity. Um, explosive nano diamond synthesis. Detonation synthesis utilizes gas, gas based and liquid based coolants such, such as argon and water, water based forms and ice. Extensive cleaning methods must be must be employed to to the mixture of impurities. Nano diamonds is often utilized in specialty coating, lapping, production of polymers, and polishing applications. That's all from us, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We are from Group 3 and we are going to present about fire-based nanocomposites, uh, nanocellulose. So, uh, a, a little bit of introduction. Nanostructure cellulose has received tremendous uh, attention due to its inherent unique properties such as high uh, strength, high surface area, abundant and uh, renewable. Um, back then, the early... Uh, the early polymer industry was, co was nearly completely based by waste and cellulose is one of the most important materials. Uh, it has only after Second World War that uh, changed in and 
propelled petroleum as the main source of material. Uh, but due to uh, rising of glo global awareness about green products, uh, cellulose is introduced as the alternative or the petroleum-based uh, product. Uh, so what is cellulose? Nanocellulose is a natural nanomaterial that can be extracted from plant cell wall. It derives from the most abundant polymeric resource in nature with inherent biodegradability. Nanocellulose is an interesting nanofiller for the development of bio nanocomposites processed by traditional process processing technique. Well dispersed nanocellulose is able, is able to enhance several properties of polymers, including thermal, mechanical, barrier, and surface wettability properties, as well as control of at least compound relief. Uh, there is different morphological form of nanocellulose, such as cellulose nanocrystal, CNC, cellulose <coughs> nanofibers, CNF, bacterial nanocellulose, BNC, and cellulose produced by cell-free systems. Uh, I'll give it to the next person. Okay, uh, so today I will talk about the characteristic and the properties of nanocellulose. Uh, there's a lot of uh, characteristic and the properties of nanocellulose, but today I will talk uh, about three of them. Okay, the first one is the barrier properties. Uh, as you can see here, there are there are one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six uh, barriers properties of the nanocellulose. The first one is the oxygen barriers. Okay, uh, how the how nanocellulose is uh, barricades all the properties, uh, all the gases from going through uh, the nanocellulose is uh, is because of the crystalline domain. The crystalline domain is, is the, the arrangement of the crystalline uh, nanocellulose that blocks all the gases. The first one, I will talk about the oxygen barrier. Uh, nanocellulose can effectively block the uh, passage of the oxygen, make it, making it useful for the preserving and freshness of the shelf life of the food and other products. And the second one is the water vapor barrier. Nanocellulose also can block the water vapor uh, water vapor barrier, uh, <coughs> making it useful to preventing, preventing moisture from entering the packaging and coatings. Uh, and the, the third one is the oil and grease barrier. Uh, nanocellulose also effectively block the passage of the oil and grease, making it useful for uh, packaging and coating. As you can see here, all the, uh, the barrier properties is especially uh, can be uh, the nanocellulose can be specifically uh, be a food packaging of the uh, food package food packaging because of the the uh, the small chance of the oxygen uh, and the water uh, goes inside the food because uh, to prevent the the food becomes bad. Uh, the fourth one is the barriers to gas. Nanosolar also can block the passage of the gases, such as CO2, making it useful for the packaging coatings. The last one is the barrier to odors and flavor. Uh, okay. The next one is mechanical properties. As you, can see, uh, as you know, the, nanosol uh, the cellulose and the nanocellulose uh, is the same, but the nanocellulose is the... the the smaller, the smaller, it's not the smallest part. The, the smaller dimension of the nano, uh, of the cellulose. Okay, the make up, the mechanical properties, uh, like the like Doctor Mafazi said the last class about the cellulose uh, mechanical properties. It is strong and have a have a strength about have a strength about uh, five. 5 to 20 gigapascal, which is similar to the high performance carbon fiber. Okay, the next one is the high modulus. High modulus means uh, nanocellulose has a high modulus, which is measure of the material stiffness. 
it can be as the 100 to 200 gigapascal, which is similar to the high performance carbon fiber, also the same as the one. Okay. Uh, the third one is the high toughness. Uh, nano cellular also can be high toughness, which ability to absorb the energy before the breaking, which can be the, the best thing to make the shield for the army. Okay. The, the fourth one is the anis, anisotropy. Nano cellulose is a anisotropic, meaning they, make, they are mechanical depending on the direction of the fiber. Like the paper, the direction of the fiber is uh, it's like this one. So uh, is this the same as the uh, as the paper? Is this paper is also is anisotropy? If we if we pull it from the uh, from the one side of the fiber, it will break. But the the Okay, the, uh, if we pull it from the longitudinal, longitudinal direction, it will break. But if we pull it from the transverse direction, it will not break. Okay. The last one is the high degree of crystallinity. Uh, just like I said from the last uh, previous uh, slide, about the crystallinity of the nanocellulose, which contribute to the mechanical properties. Okay. Uh, nanocellulose also can form a bulk foam and an aerogel. We can see uh, the bulk foam, uh, just like the polystyrene foam, but it made from the nanocellulose. Uh, what is the, the best thing about the bulk foam uh, from the nanocellulose? We can make it the food packaging, like the we buy, like we get from the cafe, is that it can. It can, um, it can combine with the thin cells of the starch, which make it more stronger. Okay, about the aerogel. Aerogel is a thing uh, which is co com which is uh, about the ninety-eight of the oh, ninety-eight percent of the weight, ninety-eight percent of the volume is ba is based. Is air. If we compress the aerogel of the nanocellulose, it will make a magnetic thin slice of the uh, magnetic nano papers. Okay, that's all from me. I will pass to the next presenter. Okay, so now I will present about uh, production of nanocellulose. Uh, so uh, nanocellulose uh, can be produced from any any cellulosic so source material such as wood. Uh, sugar beet, cotton, and more. However, it is uh, generally produced from wood pulp because wood is uh, certainly the most important um, industrial source of cellulosic fibers. So the production of nanocellulose includes the removal of non-cellulose impurities, separation, and uh, water suspension. So for the removal of non-cellulose impurities, uh, it can be done using a homogenizer. The, uh, where the homogenizer is used to delimit the cell walls uh, of the fiber of the fiber and to separate the nano sized fibrils uh, to explain more about how the homogenizer works it works um, it is as you can see here it is a, a powerful device that uses a piston pump to force the product to a very small uh, adjustable hole uh, at a high pressure, which then um, subjected to a very intense energy force, and then the product will become very small. And then uh, for the next process is the separation process, where the separation is done by beating the mixture gently, uh, where it allows the fiber to form a thick paste of needle-like crystal or a spaghetti-like structure of cellulose fibrils. Uh, the thick paste that obtained can also be a shape and readily used to laminate the surfaces. Uh, once the separation uh, process is completely done, uh, the nanocellulose is in a water suspension uh, stage, where at this stage, sh uh, care should be taken to prevent any uh, formation of rough clumps, uh, 
in cases when the in cases when the nanocellulose um, sticking together uh, as the material dries. So uh, due to this, researchers uh, have thus developed a process that allow the, allows nanocellulose to dry without rough clumps, where it also prevents the fibrils from sticking together and enables the cellulose fibers to retain, to retain their mechanical properties. So to have a closer, closer look on, how, on the, what is that, the homogenizer, and this one is the uh, closer look of nanocellulose from uh, Prof Mohini. Then I will pass to the next presenter. Okay, so next I will present about the application of nanocellulose. Uh, the first one is food packaging. Um, nanocellulose in bacterial nanocellulose cellulose nanofiber and cellulose nanocrystal can be developed into food packaging because it has a reasonable physical, physical mechanical characteristic and variability to oxygen and water vapor. Um, this here is actually uh, an experiment made by a bio-nanologist to test how nanocellulose can be spread, uh, spread onto a more biodegradable material to uh, to as an alternative to plastic. So here, uh, he used a cardboard. This is uh, bef uh, the cardboard before he spread the nanocellulose. As you can see, there are so many holes there. And after he separate the nanocellulose, you can, uh, there is barely any hole can be seen. So this shows, um, um, so uh, the nanofiber in gel will attract uh, one another and become very tight. So there is no oxygen molecule can pass through the nanocellulose. Um, and in fact, this nanocellulose is better at stopping oxygen than plastic. So it is a good alternative to plastic. And it's, uh, it is a environmentally friendly. Since um, uh, other than that, it is also good um, food packaging than plastic because uh, oxygen can degrade uh, food. So since nanocellulose can uh, uh, since oxygen can go through nanocellulose, uh, nano so it is a very good pack food packaging. Other than that is um, nano paper. It is, since nano paper is lightweight, wide range, has wide range of sources and excellent mechanical properties, it is a very attractive substrate for electronic devices. It is also recyclable, compatible with biological objects and easily biodegrades because the nano paper are made from nanocellulose, which is made from wood. So it can be biodegraded back into the wood. Um, next is uh, paper reinforcing agent. The nanocellulose can enhance fiber fiber bond strength by applying cellulose nanofiber as a coating material on the surface of paper and paperboard. It can improve the barrier properties, which is air resistance and grease oil resistance. So it can make the paper more strong. The next one is um, it can become it can also become a food stabilizing agent. Um, the nanocellulose is an excellent hydrocolloid additive in the food industry and it is also can be used as a low calorie food additive, uh, texture enhancer and stabilizer, uh, uh, stabilizer and also to thicken the substitute. Uh, since the food stabilizing has uh, seen the nanocellulose has high viscosity even at lower concentration, it, it is also attractive as a calorie-free stabilizer and gelling agent in food applications. Next, I will pass to the next presenter. Okay, so for the conclusion, I will summarize all of what we just learned today. So basically, we go to the introduction. Introduction, the nanocellulose is a natural nanomaterial which can be extracted from plant cell wall. Next, we go to the characteristic and properties of nanocellulose. Uh, I will simplify this. The barrier properties, the nanocellulose, uh, can effectively block the passage of oxygen, water vapor, oil and grease, and also gases and odor and flavors. The mechanical properties, the nanocellulose have, have high strength, high modulus, high toughness, and is, and is trophy 
and high degree of crystallinity. The production of nanocellulose, uh, the cellulosic source material, have uh, some example which is wood, sugar beet, and cotton candy, and others. So the production have three steps, which is the removal of non-cellulose impurities, the second, separation, and the third, water suspension. Uh, so there are some examples of application of nanocellulose, which is food packaging, nanopaper, paper reinforcing agent, and food stabilizing agent. So the conclusion is cellulose is the most vulnerable and essential natural polymer on the planet and is drawing greater attention in the form of nanocellulose. Consider, consider an innovative and influential material in the biomedical field. Because of its exceptional physical chemical characteristic, biodegradability, biocompatibility and high mechanical strength, nanocellulose attract considerable scientific attention. Plant, algae, and microorganisms are some of the familiar sources of nanocellulose and are usually grouped as cellulose nanocrystal, cellulose nanofibril, and bacterial nanocellulose. So I think that's all from our group. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today we're going to present about nano uh, particle commercialization challenge and recyclability issue. So I will pass it to Brother Afiq. Assalamualaikum, my name is Afi Najimi uh, What is nano composite? Eh, nano composite? So, nano composite is a type of composite material that is made up of uh, two or more distinct phases which is one of at least one dimension that is less than 100 nanometers which is a nanoparticle So, what is the difference between nanoparticle and nano composite? Nano composite is a, is a small particle that has at least one dimension that is less than 100 nanometers. Uh, while nano composite it is a material that is made of or two or more distant phases, which is a nano particle, and the other phases is a continuous or matrix phase. So. Nano composite can be created using a variety of methods, such as uh, mixing the nano composite uh, into a polymer matrix, or growing crystal uh, of the of one material within a matrix of another. So nano composite have unique properties, which is uh, due to the small size of the nano particle. One of the unique property is increased strength, and then toughness and improved thermal and electrical conductivity. Nano, nano composite can be used in a wide range of uh, application, such as in electronics, uh, energy storage, biomedical engineering, and environmental protection. Each type of nano composite has its own unique properties which can be custom or tailored for specific, for specific application by controlling the size, the shape, and distribution of the nanoparticle within the matrix. That's all from me. Okay, I will continue with my part. And my part is advantages and disadvantages of nanocomposite in the commercial industry. So, the advantages that I point out is five, and the disadvantages is only two. And the first advantages is 
um, nano composite is a good in electrical conductivity. This is because conductivity. Uh, this is because in the example of the good conductivity is carbon nano composite. In carbon nano composite, uh, it have a good ability of graphitic plane for electron for electron mobility. So when electron free to move in material, it have a good conductivity and high conductivity. So the second point is they are lighter than conventional composite because of their high degrees of stiffness and strength and are realized with far less high density material. They are, they are, they are mechanical and thermal properties are point, point, potentially superior. Nano composite also inexpensive material with high will with high surface area, porosity and high absorption properties due to their various functional group. Um, nano composite is inexpensive because the source to make nano composite is from a renewable source. And the last advantages is nano composite have advanced properties of new materials in comparison with conventional polymers. Uh, this is because nano composite consists of polymers reinforced with small quantities of nanoparticles. These advantages of nano composite is risky to health. The um, liposome drug is the example of nano composite. The development, the, the developmental work on the liposome drugs have been restricted due to inherent health issues such as square enca encapsulation efficiency, rapid waste leaking in the commodity of blood component and very poor storage and stability. It is also risky to the environment because the treatment of such waste by combustion of nanocomposite have the potential release of airborne carbon nanotubes from burning ABS injection molded nanocomposite polymers. That's all from me. I will pass to Yasmin. Okay, um, I'll be explaining about the uh, recyclability issue. So I've uh, separated into two parts, uh, which uh, the first one is I'll be explaining about how, um, what makes the nanocomposite have the recyclability issue. And the other one is uh, we're gonna um, discuss about how to approach in addressing the recyclability issue. So the first one, um, the reason is because of the size and dispersions of nanoparticles. We all know that the, um, the size of nanoparticles is very small, and um, this uh, will make uh, will arise. This will rise this difficulty to separate from the metric materials um, during the recycling process. Um, and in addition, uh, the nano the nanoparticles um, will disperse unevenly uh, in the materials, so it will make difficult to separate them uh, separate them uh, during the recycling. And then we mo we moving on to the uh, next one, which is the limited recycling process. Um, there is no doubt that the technology to recycle this type of material is, st is still in the early stages. So that is why it's um, it um, uh, it is uh, one of the reason why there's re why the recycling process um, can be. Uh, I mean, like this is the reason why nanocomposite. Um, have the uh, difficulties to recycle. And the next one is collection and separation. Um, the recycling, the collection and separation uh, happens because uh, it may not be easy separated from other types of materials during the collections of uh, materials. Um, and this may lead to an efficient recycle uh, process. And the last one is lack of standard and regulation. Uh, there may be a lack of standard and regulation um, in um, 
I mean, like, uh, in pr uh, proper handling, use, and disposal of uh, nanoparticles. Um, and it, this will lead to inconsistency of uh, practices and can lead to, uh, can harm to the environment and also uh, to the human health. So we mo uh, we'll moving on to the next one, which is the, to approach, approach to addressing the recyclability issues. So the first one is develop new recycling method that can ethically separate uh, nanoparticles from mater materials. So the scientists have come out with three methods, uh, which, is, uh, which are the first one is um, supercritical fluid extraction, the second, the second one is mechanochemical treatment, and the third one is, um, the third one is um, super sonification. Um, the second one is by establishing a collection and um, a recovery system. Uh, the, the collection and recovery, uh, the collection and recovery um, end of life products should be um, implemented and designed um, in a manner to promote recycle um, and also um, to uh, recovery of ver valuable materials. So uh, the next one is design materials. So we, uh, we should design, we can design materials so the nanoparticles can be easily separated from the metric metrics during the recycling process. Um, this uh, can happen um, by um, using the nano uh, nanoparticles with different properties of, um, with different properties or morphologies or also incorporating uh, function groups also, uh, or uh, by uh, using a different coating so that we can separate the nanoparticles um, uh, during uh, the recycling. And the last one is by use bio di biodegradable and bio-based materials at the metric matrix material. So um, for example, uh, we have used, um, we have used, um, uh, hold on. If I do this. Uh, yeah, we have used um, uh, cellulose, chitosan, and proteins to uh, to produce uh, nano uh, particles. So that by using this type of materials, we can decompose the uh, nano particles um, by harmless uh, process and not harm to the environment. So that is all for me. I'll be passing to another. Uh, Okay, Assalamualaikum. Today I'm going to present about challenge of commercialize, commercialization challenge of nanoparticles. First, we have high cost of producing it. Why? Because uh, first, it needs significant, uh, it needs uh, specialized equipment such as high energy mills, high pressure reactors, and high temperature furnitures. Uh, this equipment can be expensive to purchase, uh, to maintain, and to to operate. The second reason is have complex process. Uh, the the synthesizing nanoparticles can be complex, uh, can be complex and have multi step involving various chemical reaction and physical process. For the second challenge is difficult to control and predict. Why? Because of uh, because of its size and shape. Um, Properties of nanoparticles are highly depend on the size and shape. Small various of change can uh, can result difference in properties. For the second reason is uh, its surface chemistry. The surface can be chemically reactive or inert, and it can change the particle behavior. So for the third uh, challenge is unique properties. Why? Because it have high surface area to a volume ratio. 
uh, small size particle, small size nanoparticle have uh, small size nanoparticle will result a large height surface area to volume ratio, and it will increase the strength, stiffness, and stab uh, and thermal stability. For the second reason is uh, it have barrier properties like body crumb have present in the previous group. So for the fourth challenge is potential health and environmental risks. Uh, first reason is toxicity. Some, partic uh, some nanoparticles have been found to be toxic to environment because it uh, has small size that can be easily get into cells and cause damage. Second reason is uh, its reactivity. Some uh, nanoparticles have been found that have highly reactive and can uh, and can lead to generate a harmful byproduct. So for the last challenge, difficult to scale up uh, production of nanocomposite. Why? Because first, uh, because of its characterization. Characterizing nanoparticles can be difficult due to its small uh, small size and complex structure. So uh, it will be more challenging to assess the quality of the material. Second, the reason is uh, because of the cost. Cost of uh, raw material, uh, the equipment and process itself are significantly higher than uh, composite material. Therefore, it can impact the scalability of the process. So, we will continue with Sister Hizani. Okay. Uh, I will continue to talk about commercialization challenge of nanocomposite. The first one is complicated of processing. Uh, to, for example, to produce graphene um, by method uh, depositing vapor from gas to form graphene or using chemical treatment of graphite, it can be more efficient, but it tends to produce more impurities uh, in the resulting of graphene. And then the, scale, the second is uh, poor mechanical stability. For example, metal organic frameworks uh, due to the relatively weak metal ligand coordination bond. Many metal organic frameworks are chemically unstable and have low endurance in different type of chemical environments such as acidic or basic environment. And then the third is time consuming process. For example, to produce nano silica, to produce it, we use a micro immersion method, which is by involved mixing oil, water, immersifier, and conservatants such as alcohol in an accurate ratio to prepare micro immersion, followed by the addition of another reactant that diffuse in the micro emulsion. This reactant infiltrate into the reverse missile and after the massification is washed, separated, dry and calcined to obtain nano silica. This method allows convenience particle size regulation in the preparation of nanoparticles with small size particles and good monodispersity. However, this process is so laborious and time consuming to carry out due to the uh, to the, the due to the long reaction time and complicated post processing. Post processing is obtained because eh, post processing is necessary because to obtain nanoparticle. So nano silica we obtain after post processing process by such as by drying. And then the last one is and then the last is high energy consumption and required complex technology. The example is non, to produce nano silica powder. To produce it, we use the chemical precipitation method, which is by exploit the solubility of metal salt or alkalis to adjust the acidity. The temperature and the solvent of solution when preparing the precipitate. And then wash, dry, and heat it to obtain nano silica powder. The process is very sim simple and 
prepared product has a small particle size and large specific surface area, but the raw materials are very expensive, require complex technology, and the equipment equipment requirement are so high and easy low yielding. That's all. For us. Thank you. Okay, Assalamualaikum, we are Group 5 and today we are going to present about 3D printing filament. So, but before we go to that, I'm going to explain to you about the 3D printing. So, 3D printing is the same thing as normal printing. The only difference is it doesn't use color cartridges, but instead it uses uh, materials, uh, special printing materials uh, which known as filaments. Uh, and also, 3D printer doesn't print a text document image like normal printing. It prints a real-life model based on your computer. So we go on the 3D printing filaments. So 3D printing filaments are the thermoplastic feedstock used for fuse deposition model in 3D printers. So what the meaning here is filament used in 3D printing are thermoplastic, which are plastic, or you can call it as polymer. It melts when it heats, uh, it can be shaped, molded, and it can be solidified when cooled. So there are many types of filaments available with different properties such as EBS, PLA, PG, TPU, HIPS, nylon, and wood. So each type of this filament has different properties, which is such as physical properties like strength, flexibility, durability, difficulty to use, the temperature, and many more, which will be explained later on. So as we go to the properties of filament. Okay. Today I will explain about the properties of 3D filament in 3D printing. First, we have ABS. ABS is stands for Iconitributadine styrene. ABS is less popular than PLA, but it's actually moderate superior to PLA. Okay, the strength for LBS is medium, flexibility is medium, durability is high, difficulty to use is medium, print temperature is around 210 uh, until 250 Celsius, print bed temperature is around 50 until 110 Celsius, shrinking and wrapping is considerable, density is 1010 kg per meter cube, food safety is not food safe. Okay, pros. Uh, using ABS as your 3D filament is first is high durability uh, and it's resistant to high temperature. The cons using ABS is wrap easily, uh, hazardous film and require a high temperature nozzle print. ABS usually is good uh, per, good uh, general purpose 3D filament, uh, especially with the item frequently handled, dropped and heated such as uh, phone case, high weight toss and two handle. Next, we have PLA. PLA is stand, is, uh, stand for polyactic acid. Uh, it's the most popular 3D printing filament. Okay, the properties is the strength is medium, flexibility is low, durability is medium, difficulty to use is low, print temperature is around 180 Celsius to 230 Celsius, print bed temperature is 20 to 70 Celsius, uh, shrinkage and wrapping is minimal, the CT is 1,240 kg per meter cube. Pros using uh, PLA is easy to print, biodegradable, and a um, wide variety of color and type and style. The cons using PLA as your 3D printing filament first is brittle and lacks luster mechanical properties. PLA is, is used for consumer products. Next, we have PETG. PETG stands for poly, uh, polyethylene terephthalene glycol. Uh, PET is one of the common used plastic in the world. PETG often considered as a good middle ground between PLA and ABS because it's more durable than PLA but is easy to print than ABS. PETG is hygroscopic, means it absorbs moisture from the air. So you need to uh, store it in dry and cool, cool place. Okay, the strength of PETG is medium, 
flexibility is high, durability is high, durability to use is medium, print temperature is 220 Celsius to 235 Celsius. Print bed temperature is no heated bed needed. Shrinkage and wrapping is minimal. Density is 1,270 kg per meter cube. The pros using PETG as your 3D printing filament is first is flexible, uh, durable and easy to print. Cons is susceptible to moisture. Surface crash easily. Uh, PETG is an ideal 3D printing filament used for functional parts uh, which might experience a sudden stress or strength, uh, such as mechanical parts, printer parts, and protective component. Okay, so hi, uh, I'm Adam Mikhail, and I will be continuing the four of the other filament properties that we have here which is the first one is HIPS so this HIPS uh, is a low cost plastic is and is modified from uh, polystyrene so this, this, so this HIPS here is actually a high impact polystyrene so it's kind of different than the polystyrene that we know of because it, this one has a higher uh, impact resistance so the pros of using it is a it's a good impact resistant and while it is a low cost the cons is that it releases fumes when it's being uh, used so as it uh, as on the side the properties are there so the strength is low the flexibility is medium the durability is high while the difficulty to use is medium so the print temperature is around 210 celsius to 250 celsius while the print bed temperature is around 50 celsius to 100 celsius so the shrinkage is uh, considerable while the density is around 1040 so the next one we have is a tpu so tpu is a uh, thermal plastic thermal polyurethane so plastic polyurethane so TPU has a unique characteristic that is made uh, elastic like rubber but is yet durable. So the pros of using it is, uh, is, is flexible, stretchy like rubber, shock and impact resistance and it has a huge variety of color. While well, the cons is that it is difficult to post process because, because of its abrasion and chemical resistance. So the properties is like as shown. The strength is low, flexibility is high, medium for durability, difficulty to use is high, while the print temperature is around 225 Celsius to 235 Celsius, it doesn't need any heated bed. The shrinkage is minimal, but it is not safe for food usage. So the second as is nylon. So nylon uh, is perfect for making quality prints for engineering material components hardware. While well, the pros are high strength, high flexibility, and high durability. While well, the cons is that you need to monitor the dryness because it can lead to uneven printing. So the properties as I shown, the strength is very high, high for flexibility and durability, medium for difficulty to use. While well, the print temperature is around 220 Celsius to 260 Celsius. The print bed temperature is around 50 Celsius to, uh, to 100 Celsius. The warping is uh, considerable and the density is like shown. And the last of the filament that we have is wood. So, uh, wood is a filament that is a typically, typically combines with a PLA based material. So, the pros are that uh, it has an aromatic smell and uh, it is aesthetically appealing lah. like Dr. Wan just gave us to uh, feel it uh, in one of his class before well the cons are is that it needs a larger nozzle uh, to be used and it's prone to stringing so the next one that we have is oh the next one is the influence of 3D print
Okay. So just like uh the properties that we have for illness is different for each one, right? So because it plays a key when uh having the finished product. So it's very crucial in using the right filament when three D painting. So one of the filaments, uh, one of the influence that we have is material properties. So the final characteristics of the three D printed object will depend on the strength, flexibility, and temperature resistance of each filament. For instance, the PU is flexible and rubber light, while EPS is tough and long lasting, making them both perfect for painting phone cases. Me myself, uh, if you can see, this this is a TPU, uh, TPU phone case, right? So the next one is printing temperature. So the best printing temperatures for various filaments vary, which may have an impact on the print's output. Others can be printed at lower temperatures while certain filaments need higher temperatures to print properly. So the third uh, influence that print quality. So your choice of filament may also have an impact on the general print quality. A smooth surface finish is produced by some filaments, whereas a porous or rough surface finish is produced by other filaments. Uh, the fourth influence is post-processing, which some filaments need further uh, post-processing such as sanding, painting, or gluing to improve the finished result. The second last influence uh, is cost. So, depending on the type of material and brand, filament prices can change. The cost of 3D printing project may vary depending on the cost of filament use. So, like, uh, uh, like uh, the properties that I just said before some of them might uh, may be cheaper than the other filament because of the manufacturing such as BLE because they 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 use renewable sources so they are more in common in use of pre printing today and the cost is very cheap uh, rather than using other filaments. So the last one is about health and safety. So it is critical to select a filament that is safe to use in your particular location because some filaments may emit fumes or particularly matter that may be ha uh, hazardous to human health, such as uh, uh, HIVs, right? Okay, so that is all for me. So next, I'm going to talk about uh, how the filaments is made. So, so this process is called compounding. So first, uh, the raw plastic resin in the form of pellets is produced. Uh, these pellets can be mixed with additive to obtain their mechanical properties. Uh, the mixture then is dried and as true to the desired width, usually around 1.75 mm or 2.85 mm. Then it's worn on a spool. Then once it's worn, the material is ready to be used in 3D printing. So for the preparation, as we all know that the pellets will be uh, solidified into their stream-like form. So the pellets are put into the industrial blender and mixed with additive in order to create a consistent blend and contribute specific properties to the filament. So additive can include colorants, which is to determine the color or other things that contribute properties such as impact resistance, strength, structural integrity, and even magnetic properties. So exotic filaments such as wood are uh, made by mixing special additives such as sawdust or wood particle with the plastic pellets. So then once it's once the pellets are properly mixed, they move on to the drying phase. So the like filament, the pellets are hygroscopic, meaning that they absorb moisture from the air. 
This can deform or degrade the plastic. Therefore, removing any moisture from the pellets is necessary to ensure the production of quality of the filament. <coughs> Pellets are typically dried around 60 Celsius to 80 Celsius for a few hours. But the process varies uh, depending on the manufacturer. So uh, on the shaping part, in the first parts of shaping, uh, the pellets are fed, are fed into the filaments extruder, which includes a heating chamber. Uh, in this chamber, each pellets are melted into a gooey substance so that they can be shaped easily. The string-like bond material, uh, better known as filament, leave the heating chamber through a round nozzle and move on the cooling station. So then, after the filament leaves the heating station, it pulls through multiple water chamber. The first chamber is the first chamber is full of warm water, which is an important factor in achieving a round filament. Then the right, the right temperature setting according to the material helps to prevent oval-shaped filament, which is problematic for 3D printing. So then uh, the second chamber is full of cold water, which cools the filament down and solidifies it into a new shape. The speed by which the filament is pulled determines, by the, determines the diameter of the filament. A slower speed will result in a larger diameter, while the faster speed does the opposite. So for the last step, the motors pull the filament from the cooling chamber to the spooling mechanism. The spooling process starts with measuring the filament's diameter by a laser device to ensure it's within the tolerance of the target diameter, most likely uh, 1.75 millimeter or 2.85 millimeter. Ah, the filament is then attached to a spool and worn around it. Once sensors detect that the spool is full, the filament is cut and secured. Then the process starts again, filling the next spool until the batch is, of filaments is exhausted. And that's all from our group. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Uh, we are from Group C and we're going to present about 3D print design consideration and how it works. Okay, let's start with the first part, which is how 3D printing uh, works. Okay. For the first first point, which is design a 3D project, and uh, to make sure it's easy for you to understand how uh, about the designing a 3D object, uh, you can imagine a bread, roti, eh. uh, we call it gardenia. gardenia. Why? Because when you open the plastic, you can see the bread is uh, already sliced one by one, which is uh, it will be like this. Uh, sorry for the <laughs> bad drawing. And uh, to do design project, you need to do it in a software. And here we come up with the two software, which is the free. Uh, usually people use Blender and Dust Studio. And you think you a little bit well, you can go for the pay software. Of course, when you say about a pay software, it have an extra feature on it. And the next is about saving. Uh, actually, it's about uh, printing, saving and printing. It's okay. Uh, after you finish your design, you need to uh, copy it and put it on a memory card. And after that, uh, the memory card will be put in a 3D printer. And it will extract your project and print it layer by layer. And about the uh, ink, is. Like uh, choose the filament according to your preference. Like other uh, like a previous uh, group present, there are where many type of uh, filament. And here, a summary on how it actually work. It start from idea, go to 3D model, and it's go to slicing, which is layer by layer, and upload. Go to filament, setup, print, remove, and post processing. 
And for the 3D printing, it can be long because uh, it's print layer by layer. It actually can be go for one day, I think. I think that's all from my part. Let's go to the next part. Uh, next, I will talk about advantages and use cases of 3D printing. Of course, there are a lot of advantages and use cases of 3D printing. Uh, firstly, is food printing. For example, uh, 3D, uh, 3D chocolate printing. Scientists use 3D printing technology to make chocolate more crackly, but the process is more complex than you think. Um, it allows the team to um, print any shape of chocolate while maintaining the best material. Of course, this uh, food can be eaten since it is made from 3D printed meals. Um, the advantages is uh, it allows chefs to experiment with textures and designs that have never been created before. It helps to reduce food waste by allowing the 3D printing to use exactly the right amount of ingredients. If there is wasted food, it can be recycled by being a material source for 3D printed food. Um, in addition, 3D, uh, 3D printed food uh, is getting serious attention from NASA for longer missions such as traveling to Mars. This technology could produce um, nutritious and good testing meals in space including pizza. Um, next, we have seen 3D printed ears, arms, legs and muscles. Besides, it is also used to produce artificial tissue, cells and skin. One project known as the Body on a Chip run by a hospital in North California prints miniature human hearts, lungs and blood vessels, place them on a microchip and test them out with a kind of artificial blood. Apart from replacement <coughs> Apart from replacement body parts, 3D is increasingly being used for medical education and training like the surgeons from hospital in Miami, California, practice surgery on 3D printed replicas of children's hearts. Lastly, it is also being used for personalizing products. From toothbrush to candy wrappers, it uses 3D printing as it is convenient, cheap and disposable. In 2013, New York Times columnist challenged himself to print an entire meal, including the plate and cutlery. Who believe in future, 3D printed can be prepared that, uh, a meal that match our body nutritional needs. Uh, okay. uh, hi everyone, and now I'm going to be talking about design consideration. But before I start, uh, may I share a joke with everyone about 3D printer? Uh, that's a joke. Uh, that's a kid. He says to his mom, uh, 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 okay. uh, Mom, look, I think I'm a 3D printer. And then the mom says, Oh, come on, Johnny, close the door when you poop. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. okay, so we will be talking about design considerations. Ah, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, there are certain limitations to the materials and manufacturing processes that dictate how we must design our product. Okay. Uh, the first consideration is we need to design the base. Uh, first layer need to adhere to the bed for the duration of the print. If the model loses edition during the print, game, game over. Uh, this, is a no, this is a common mistake happened to newbie, uh, but it usually uh, happen when we choosing different material that really not not really compatible with the printer bed. Or sometimes if we uh, uh, if we put our nozzles uh, that extrudes our filament too far away from our printer bed, then when it when we extrude them, uh, it already cooled uh, before it touched the printer bed, so it will not stick to the printer bed. Okay, but all that. Uh, we not talking. We talking about three, three only. Uh, firstly, about high enough surface area onto the printer bed, so that uh, we will have enough stick to the printer bed, so it will not like uh, moving when we print really high or something. Second, uh, we will be we need to have a wide enough base to support model and resist tipping. Uh, Usually, if we have, if we want to build like a tower or something, 
uh, it's best for us to orient them uh, like laying down to have a wide enough base to uh, avoid tipping lah. Okay, uh, and lastly, uh, we have need to have a strong enough material to resist warping caused by different cooling rates. Um, yeah, I, I forgot. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, and this one, uh, we need uh, we we need to make sure our our filament doesn't get cooled really quick. So like we need to make sure them really we need to make sure our filament is really really what uh, will really really hot so it will stick to the printer bed. So it will have a strong enough uh, stick to the printer bed. So it will resist warping. Warping happen when the filament is uh, cooled down really fast before it reach the next layer. So it will cause warping like like it will like move up something from the printer bed. Okay, that's about the design in the base. And then we will be talking about the grain direction. Okay, the layers of a material is the weakest point and can be peeled apart at the points where they are joined together. Uh, okay, our model needs to be oriented correctly if it is designed for a structural application. Uh, okay, uh, the filament that we are building our 3D print, right? Uh, it is like a worm, like a worm, a really long worm. Then we extrude them, and the the force between each worm, right? Uh, it's not really, it's not really high. It's not really strong. Uh, it is really weak for a sheer force. Like uh, it will easily can be peeled apart. So if we are building like this one. Uh, hydraulic, jet, hydraulic jet screw, it will receive a compression force uh, right from here, right? So if we build our um, 3D print like this, vertical direction, the grain will be like this, like this, like this. Then we will, then we, if we put them like this, it will experience shear force, and it is not really good for for it. We need to build them like this, so it will have a grain like this. So it will have a uh, so it will experience a normal force and it can withstand the force lah. Okay, that for the green direction. And last for me is about overhangs and holes. We need to avoid hangs at over forty five degrees where the filament will contact with the previous layer less than fifty percent. Okay, like this picture, uh, we can see. Uh, make sure not steep, steeper than forty five degree. It is because uh, like I said previous. Uh, about the worm, right? Uh, if at zero degree angle, the worm like it will start hundred percent contact with the previous layer. But if at ninety degree, uh, it will like eh, then it will fall out before before it reach the next layer. It will fall out. So we need to make sure uh, not not high than forty five degree. So it will contact less than fifty percent and not bigger than fifty percent. Sorry. So then uh, we also can avoid overhang by orient the object like this. If you are building like a T object, we can like uh, what upper? Ah, uh, upside down. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, then like H. Uh, we, but actually, if you look carefully, uh, all of them we can lie down, right? Just lie down, no overhang. So need to think properly, yeah. And lastly, uh, about holes. Uh, sometimes when uh, when we are building 3D print object that has horizontal design hole, uh, usually at the at the top part right, they will have like this. Not a perfect scope, not per perfect hole. So if we are like not if we, if we want to put a rod or something that is perfectly fit, if we need to trim a bit. Oh, we need to trim a bit. So to avoid trimming, trimming, uh, we can use a teardrop, teardrop shape. So yeah, no, no, no longer this. So yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Yeah, for, I pass to my friend. So uh, the next crucial point to be considered in the design stage is wall thickness. Wall thickness is defined as the number of times the extruder will lay filament around the perimeter of the model before switching to the infill factor. Uh, issues with wall thickness are among the most typical design problems and can cause printing failures. If the walls uh, of your parts are too thin, uh, it can cause uh, it will result in a very fragile print uh, that can easily be broken or damaged. On the other hand, if the walls of your parts are too thick, uh, it can cause internal stresses and leads to undesirable results such as cracking. 
So the general rule of thumb is to make uh, the wall slightly thicker. Uh, the wall thickness of more than 0.8 millimeters generally allows for a successful printing of parts with all the 3D printing models, methods. Next is rounded corners. Rounded corners in a structural point of view is stronger than square edges. They also apply less wear and tear on your printer because the change in direction is gradual instead of sudden. Uh, add a rounded brim instead of sharp corners to your 3D model and try to avoid long flat surfaces. As the corners are rounded off, the stress can be distributed more evenly. Next is torrances. Torrances is a measure of how far a measurement deviates from the target value. Torrances can be optimized by using a high quality filament and making sure that uh, you properly and recently uh, calibrate the extruder. Uh, torrents are uh, always expressed as a range. For instance, uh, a column with length 5 cm can have a torrents of 0.05 cm. This means that the actual measurement of the length of the column uh, can range from 4.95 cm to 5.05 cm. Clearances and torrances are two closely linked concepts. When you design a part with very small clearance, you need to be certain that this can be achieved based on the tolerance of your 3D printer. Otherwise, there is that the clearance or gap will be fused because of very small measurement deviations. Okay. Okay, for the last part, uh, for the design condition of consideration of 3D, uh, we have mockups which uh, design parts that have critical tolerances can be isolated separately, uh, such as the the example is the dashboard uh, dashboard clip. Uh, the uses of dashboard clip is to mount the cell phone. Uh, uh, for this mockup, it's allowed to test the shape alone without worry worrying the rest of the model. So, uh, how to do the mockups? Uh, we need to print the top and the bottom separately. Then we reincorporate shapes back into main model. Uh, for this uh, this uh, mockup, it will take numerous interactions in order to get the fit just right. Uh, for the second is uh, unique properties. Uh, unique properties uh, is not limited to designing a rigid or solid object. Uh, there are some experiments occur to exploit characteristic. Uh, for the example of unique properties, we can see that uh, as a variable for uh, example given for the first one is jellyfish model. Uh, jellyfish model uh, has that natural dripping effect to create tentacles of the jellyfish. Uh, for the second example is uh, stretchy bracelet design. We can see as the picture above, uh, that is stretchy bracelet design. Uh, it is printed with single wall thickness and squiggly shape. Uh, uh, for that uh, printed, uh, it to lens its flexibility. Okay, uh, for the third one is G-code. Uh, G-code is... Uh, a set of computer instruction that generated to tell printers step by step how to print the model. Uh, so uh, before we print the model, we need to look at the visualization of the G code before sending it to, to the printer. Uh, the visual, visual, visualization show the model look like layer by layer. Uh, usually, there are some wrong in the model if it isn't solid. Uh, so, looking at the G-code visualization helps to correct it. Uh, so, uh, most of the 3D printers have so has software of this G-code built in it. Uh, I think that's all from me and this group. Uh. Right, thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to everyone in this room. So inshallah today we are from group 7 going to present about 3D printing. Uh, so there are two parts in our presentation which is uh, current research and also future trend. So uh, first of all let's, let's take a look in the introduction part.
Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So before we go further towards our main idea, um, let me start first with the introduction. So what is 3D printing actually and what is the use of 3D printing for the future? So 3D printing is an additive process whereby layers of material are built up to create a 3D part. So it is a method of creating a 3D by using a computer added design using software. So the designers or the engineers itself um, can transform the object using a 3D printing. So this technology enables uh, manufacturing models in various sizes and purposes. So there are a variety of 3D printing materials such as um, thermoplastic, metal, nylon, plaster, ceramic and edible materials. These all uh, example, these all materials uh, have their own has, have their own um, unique features, strengths and st texture that uh, need to be considered by the engineers to avoid 3D printing mistakes. So, because of the variety of 3D materials, um, it will produce a variety of products. So, according to that, 3D printing industries has applications across a range of industries due to the versatility of the process. So, these are three examples that uh, involve in 3D printing. So for the first example, this aerospace, aerospace industries. So the photo, the photo here is a blisk. Um, this is a turbo machine. So why um, aerospace industries use uh, 3D printing for their industries? So it is because 3D printing is used due to the ability to create light and geometric complex part. So, um, because, uh, because of that, they can create a, a, a high accuracy uh, object. So the next example is automotive. So it is used due to inherent weight and cost reduction. It can be produced as small parts, bespoke rind and spare parts. So this picture is car engine. So they use 3D printing to make this um, car engine just in a day. So uh, the last example is medical field. So uh, this picture is um, 3D printing replica, which is, this is the heart. So um, it involves the creation of physical replicas of anatomical structures. For example, is medical products, implants, and educational purposes. So we're aware that 3D printing gives benefits to manufacturing industries. So the research is needed to enhance this technology. So I will pass to Danish. Yeah, so thank you. Okay, so for the first part of this presentation, we're going to uh, explain about uh, current research that have we read and we will discuss in this uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, out of 1,000 uh, uh, research that has been done, we only selected two to be presented in uh, our presentation today. So uh, for the first one, uh, the 3D printed metal can we extend extreme condition with the new heat treatment. So uh, this uh, research has been conducted by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which are uh, also known as MIT. So this uh, research has been conducted in November 14, 2022. So uh, here is the list of content uh, of what I have summarized from my reading about this research. Okay, so uh, let's take a look uh, at the point. Okay, so for for the first point, they claim that uh, the new way of 3D printing metal can make the material stronger and also resilient in extreme thermal environment. Okay, uh, so resilient here means uh, the material can last longer than the normal material. And uh, also we can see in the first point, they are also mentioning about the extreme thermal environment. So uh, one of the goal of this uh, research is to make a material that can uh, hold a really uh, high temperature. Uh, okay, so for uh, the second point, they also say that the MIT developed heat treatment can transform the microscopic structure of 3D printed metal which make it stronger and more resilient. Okay, so uh, they say that they are developing uh, some kind of heat treatment method which uh, what does heat treatment method do is that they transforming the uh, microscopic structure of metal while printing the 3D metal. Okay, so uh, as we can see here, this is the normal microscopic structure of an ordinary metal. So uh, what they claim here is they're going to transform it to make it more stronger and more resilient. 
So uh, this technique could lead to 3D printed of high performance blades and also vents for gas turbine and jet engines, which will enable improved fuel consumption and also energy efficiency. Okay, uh, so basically their aim uh, on this research is to uh, help, help in developing uh, jet engines. So like uh, blade and vents, uh, so blade and vents is actually a component in a uh, jet engine which they gonna rotate uh, for a, uh, for a rot uh, fast, fast rotating and also uh, they will feel uh, some kind of hot temperature. So here they aim to make a 3D printed of this blade and vest so that it can withstand more extreme thermal condition. Okay, so uh, back then the gas turbine for blade, uh, which is blade and vest, are manufactured through the conventional casting process. Uh, and they uh, use the component made from some of the most heat resistant metal alloy uh, as they are designed to rotate at a high speed and also in extremely uh, hot gas. Okay, so basically uh, what is mean by the conventionally casting process is a process where people um, uh, mold the metal to become a liquid and then they pour it into a specific shape and they wait uh, for the shape uh, for the metal to freeze and then they get the shape that they want. So uh, basically this uh, kind of process is very uh, tough process and it took a lot of time and also a lot, a lot of energy. Uh, as we can see here, this is the process and it took about 12 sections to complete uh, a single blade. So uh, nowadays thanks to 3D printing, we can actually uh, forget about that and we can only use 3D printing to print uh, metal so we can save time, cut the cost and also increase the efficiency. So uh, next we will uh, proceed to the second research. So for the current research, uh, 3D micro printing with two lasers can be fast as lightning. So if you want to do a research, we must have a problem or a problem that are hard to overcome. So what are the problems? Uh, the problems are technological challenge uh, which, in, which needs high speed and high resolution. So the main point for 3D printing are to print the thing with precise, quick and cheap. So from KIT and KUT, which is Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and, and University of Queensland have doing a research to overcome the problem because the stereo lithography 3D printing are slow and low quality of the resolution. So for 3D printing with, so the first step is 3D printing with two color stages. So 3D printing with two color in stages is first, the first thing is blue light which projected into a container that contains liquid resin and then the red laser beam is projected to provide additional energy to cure the resin. So the return time between two successive layers are reduced until less than 100 microseconds. So for the next one is micrometer size structure in just the blink of an eye. So to take the advantage of the new resin that have been created by the second step, the blue laser diodes project image with high resolution and frame rate uh, to the new resin. And then red light laser will form into thin sheet. So with more sensitive resins, we could even use LEDs instead of lasers. In our 3D printer, says Professor Martin Wagner of APH. So that's all from me. I will pass to the next presenter. Okay, so the next one we are going to look at uh, is future trend in 3D printing. 
The first future trend in 3D printing is bioprinting. Example for bioprinting is 3D printed skin. Uh, printed skin has many usage in the medical field. So it is used as a skin graft for burn victims, people with badly wounded injuries, and people with dermatological problems as it is made with as it is printed with cells and biomaterial. So other than uh, the usage of printed skin in the medical field, we could also use it in the cosmetic industry for cosmetic testing purposes. Uh, printed skin is actually a low cost alternative to animal testing. Uh, this company will test their product onto the printed skin instead of the animal to reduce the amount of cosmetic testing on animal so that this animal uh, does not expose to chemical ingredients in that contained in the, in the product. Uh, next future trend is uh, the additive building. For example, is the 3D printed house. Uh, in the construction industry, there's many uh, advantages of this printed house than traditional house. For example, uh, this 3D printed house has shorter building period than the, than the traditional house building. Uh, it also requires less workers or laborers in the construction site because it's only um, need uh, the engineers architects and also the machine in the, in the side. Lastly, uh, the process of printing the house has more, much more efficient in terms of the energy and the material usage than the traditional house building uh, because a printed house generates less use material waste as it does not require any uh, material carving or cutting. Okay, uh, okay, next, uh, let's move on to the next future trends, which is repurposing plastic. Um, it turns out that it is possible to, sorry, it turns out that um, 3D printing also strongly supports zero waste attitude. Um, as we all know, um, plastic waste is a big problem in our world today. So, um, it is possible to transform plastic waste into filaments suitable for 3D printers. And so with, um, 3D, so with um, 3D printing today, sorry, also um, a circular production can be established with the help of 3D printing. And also the, fil um, the filament made with this kind of method is incredibly cheap. Um, uh, then use um, uh, poly then use commercial polymer materials um, as it um, still retains the um, the quality as a virgin plastic, and it actually um, um, enables you to print project at a cost less than a thousand. Uh, then you use commercial polymer filaments. And the product, the process um, to make useful products out of plastic waste um, is very straightforward. It follows the steps. First, collect plastic waste. Second, sort the waste according to type and clean it. Third, green or shred the waste into plastic beads. Next, extrude the beads into 3D printing filament or fit them directly into a 3D printer equipped with a material hopper as I put a picture there so you can imagine it better. Lastly, print a product. And therefore, um, there will be a growth in sustainable 3D printing materials such as um, recycled, reusable and biodegradable um, plastics. Um, next, um, I'll be explaining about the 3D printing trends and applications for the COVID-19 pandemic. And here is why 3D printing um, enables on demand solutions um, for a wide spectrum of needs, um, ranging from personal equipment, personal protection equipment to medical devices or isolation room. And this versatile technology is also suitable um, 
to address to address supply demand uh, imbalances caused by the socio-economic trends and the disruptions in supply chains. And so, 3D printing has helped us in dealing with the pandemic. And thanks to the 3D printing, um, we are able to meet the needs of hospitals and medical staff at critical moments. And among other things, the technology helped to speed up the production of face shields or complex ventilator components. Like in the UK and Israel, for example, protective masks were 3D printed. And as we all remember, um, a, a situation when a hospital was built in Wuhan, China, in only two weeks with the help of 3D printed materials. So um, last but not least, the pandemic has made many, com many companies realize how important it is not to depend on a complex and long supply chain. So uh, as a conclusion, as 3D printing technology continues to improve, it could democratize the manufacture of goods. And also 3D printing is important for the many benefits it brings. Um, it able to work on larger scale production projects. Uh, so the study must be done by the scientists to find out about the function of 3D printing in the industrial field in the future. So thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum and hi. So my group going to present about sustainability and health issue. So first of all, what is 3D printing? 3D printing is structuring a three-dimensional object in its physical configurations from its digital form. As you can see in this slide, it's, it's due to the process of layering itself. The other, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> the other definition of it is an object or structure that has three dimensions, which include width, length, and also height. And why, the question here is, why 3D printing is important? And why do we need it? 3D printing can um, produce extremely accurate and detailed anatomical models so that it can help the surgeon to produce um, for their complex procedures for operations. Next is the importance of 3D printing in sustainability and health issue. First of all, it can use and re can recycle materials. Why? Because uh, the 3D printing waste can be converted into filament again. <coughs> Our most common way to do this is by using the filament extruder that is provided in the market. Next, it can reduce the amounts of paper used because uh, 3D printing cut down the amounts of paper. So, thus, it can also sorry. Thus, it can also preserve the life of flora and fauna. Next is for health issue. It can improve the surgical technique through the development of organ models. For example, 3D printing can print heart, so it will be easier for the surgeons to pre um, to prepare their sutures and also the surgical technique on the heart itself before straight go to the patients. Next is the medical equipment. If you watch Grace Anatomy, you can see that in that series, Dr. Richard Weber produced a 3D a pen, a 3D printing pen that can detect uh, cancer. So, if you're in an operation and you're done with the operations, you can detect whether the cancer is left um, in the human's body or not. Next is for implants and prosthetic. So, for example, if Arena is involved in an accident that caused her to that causes her to lose the ability to use the, uh, to use the hand, she might need to use protestic. So, sorry. Um, the technology of protestic has improved steadily over the years. First, of, uh, first, it evolved from wooden stools and heavy irons in the 16th century. Next is the applications of 3D printing during COVID-19. First is nasopharyngeal swab. So this is a testing device that medical assistants um, insert into our nostrils to check the, uh, to check the presence of COVID-19. Next is medical ma uh, mannequin. It is used for training since it's a bio model. Next is Charlotte Valve. Charlotte Valve is a medical device that is used as ventilator valve and it is also known as uh, emergency devices. Last but not least is isolation wards. Isolation wards is used for emergency wellings. 
Um, okay, that's it. Video now. Oh, what? Assalamualaikum and hi, I am Nurul Irat Shakila Binti Armin with metric number 2211742. I'm here to share about how 3D printing is good for our environment. First of all, 3D printing reduce waste. The utilization of materials in traditional manufacturing is frequently inefficient. Typically, the procedure is subtractive, which means that you start with a sizable block of material, chip away at it to produce a product, and then discard the scarves. On the other hand, 3D printing is an additive method that creates a product layer by layer. There is no need to carve or trim excess material because it just uses the precise amount required in the precise way. There are consequently significantly less crop. Experts claim that 3D printing can reduce waste in the building industry by at least 95%. Sam Rubin, co-founder and senior sustainability advisor at Mighty Buildings, a California-based 3D printing construction company, says that depending on the technology, it has the potential to unlock truly zero waste construction, eliminating approximately 4.4% pounds per square foot on average that go to the landfills when building a traditionally constructed home. Less waste going to the landfill means less pollution, less poison soaking into the ground, and less greenhouse gas emissions, all of which can mitigate a climate change. No matter if you're making houses, furniture, cars, space shuttles, or medical equipment, the applications are boundless. Due to the ability to produce more useful prototypes, 3D printing also helps to reduce waste before a product is even created. It is simpler to recognize which components need to be improved and which might fail because a big portion of the design process takes place on the computer with AI assisting in the creation of spectacular simulations. Because of this, you don't have to go through as many materials which will eventually be thrown out until you figure out how to make the thing you desire. And I will continue some of the advantages from what uh, Ira have said just now. Advantage, huh? advantages. Okay, so we all know with reduced cost and safe time comes more option to create. That is to say, another benefit of 3D printing is the ability to create optimized testing and real-time fixes. Just imagine what 3D printing could bring to the world. 3D printing for product designs help, can help uh, a lot of people such as architectures, engineers, and designers to get a better idea of how a part or a product uh, will functionally works and thus enable them to make any iteration needed before committing to a single idea. So the ability to quickly print out a new piece of form without any time or budget constraints allow manufacturers to test many ideas and iteration as they need. This goes to my point first, which is custom design part. Just imagine what these architectures, the engineers and the designers can customize something. For example, I give you a simple example. For example, if you all have a 3D printer, so what if you want to create a phone holder or a phone stand? We can customize it however you want. We can customize it vertically or horizontally, or you can customize it, customize the design. Just imagine, for example, I give you what architectures can do. Architectures can design some beautiful uh, buildings, so they can customize the building however they want. They can customize such as the structure or the building concept itself. What about engineers? Engineers, maybe they can design a robot, a robot or a gear or anything that they want. Maybe just like my friend from the Group 6 said, um, the turbo from the aerospace. So my next point is print on demand. Print on demand means that uh, when you have a 3D printer, you can print something anytime that you wanted it. If you wanted to use it right now, you can print it right now. So. The advantage is it doesn't need a lot of space to stock the inventory, unlike right now, traditional manufacturing processes. This saves spaces and costs, and there is no need to print bulk unless required. It also saves the environment. So just like my group six friends says, the 3D print sign files are all stored in a virtual library. 
which they can be printed using a 3D, mo a 3D model as either a CAD or an STL file. This means that they can be located and printed when they need. So for example, if you are an engineer and you want to make a project, a robot, and when you are making that part and there are some pieces that are missing. So when the pieces are missing, you can print it on demand, like you want to print this. Oh, you can locate it uh, in a split second because it is located in the virtual. It is located in your computer. You can locate it the fast and you can print it on demand. It, and it doesn't take long to, uh, to 3D print it and use it in your prototype project. So that is all for me. I will pass it to my friend. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. To continue the pre uh, presentation, I will talk about the disadvantage of 3D printing. So for the first point is many 3D printing materials are plastic. So some material may be recycled uh, plastic, but in the end, it's, a, it's still a plastic. Uh, usually popular and cheap 3D printers, you use a plastic as the material. Um, although using raw plastic may reduce waste generation, the machine, the machine still leave unused or excess plastic in the print bed. So for your information, uh, plastic can take anywhere around 20 to 500 years to decompose depending on the material the structure, structure and environmental factors such as uh, sunlight exposure. So the plastic byproduct end up uh, in landfill negatively affect the environment. Um, plastic also limit the types of product that can be created from the material. So in future, 3D, print, 3D printers uh, will need to use other materials uh, such as metal or carbon composite uh, to become more useful to manufacturers and consumer. Consumer. So for the second point is encourage people to create more prototypes. Uh, as we know, uh, counterfeiting is one of the most significant significant disadvantage of 3D printing. Uh, anyone with a product blueprint can forge a uh, product very quickly. Uh, pattern violation will increasingly, increasingly become more common and identifi identifying counterfeited uh, item will become practically impossible. So as a 3D printing evolves, uh, pattern and copyright holders will have a harder time to protecting their copyright. Uh, and company manufacturer unit product will be significant, significantly affected. Uh, one way to prevent people from counterfeiting in 3D printing is uh, copyright protects the original works of the creator. So for the last point is 3D printing still use electricity. So uh, while production times may be considered, the amount of energy required to create a product is still high. Uh, it can take a lot of uh, energy to create something small and you are trading one problem for, uh, for another which is uh, use a lot of electricity. So in order to um, load the uses of the electricity, electricity in 3D printer, uh, it is we can adding an enclosure to your 3D printer. That's all for me, thank you. So we go to the next part which is potential hazards of 3D printing. There are three, haz three hazards which is breathing in harmful chemicals or compounds, Skin, uh, the second one is skin exposure to harmful chemicals or solvent and the third one is risk of fire and uh, explosion since it conducts in very high temperature. So uh, there are two primary threats that, we'll, we, that we will expose to which is ultrafine particles, Uf, UFPS and the second one is uh, vo volatile organic compound which is v, uh, VOCS. So what, what is uh, ultrafine Particles. It is referred to as nanoparticles. So, since it is uh, small in size, uh, it uh, they can be in, they they can be inhaled and uh, go to our bloodstream and harm our bodies. So, by exposing to ultrafine particles, uh, they can lead to cardiovascular disease, respiratory infection, and lung disease. So, we go to the to the second, which is volatile organic compound. So what is volatile? Volatile is a substance that can evaporate at normal temperature. So it is easily to evaporate at normal temp temperature. So uh, volatile can vaporize even at room temperature. And some materials that use in 3D printers, which is, uh, such as nylon, PLA, and ABS, will produce uh, vol uh, 
will produce uh, volatile organic compounds such as uh, butanol. And some VOCs are thought to be active carcinogen, which is uh, cancer active, active agents. And in some cases, uh, in 3D printers, they also use chemical, chemical solution to dissolve unnecess unnecessary pieces of 3D printing. So this uh, solution is very corrosive. It can cause blindness and chemical burns. Okay, next I will explain about ways to protect from hazard of 3D printing. Actually, ways to protect from hazard of 3D printing is depends on the material that we use. Uh, either it's metal powder or filaments. Uh, the ways that we apply is not uh, totally can avoid the hazard, but it can lower the risk. So the first thing is in terms of safety. Uh, the workers that uh, need to wear appropriate personal protective equipment. The, imp the important equipment is coveralls, safety glasses and thermal glove. As we can see in the picture, the workers is wearing body 50, 95, 95 plus. So uh, it is important for us to identify which hazard is present uh, in the process of 3D printing because we can choose uh, the kind of coveralls that is suitable during the process. Uh, for example, if we are dealing with corrosive chemical resist uh, corrosive chemical solution, we must use coveralls that have a higher resistance to chemical splash and chemical burn. So the, for the second point is to reduce time workers are in proximity to printing equipment. The alternative way that is uh, usually used is to set up the camera that are near the printing machine. So we can uh, of, uh, see the process of the printing without coming near to the machine. Okay, <laughs> okay moving on to the next point, is only trained professionals should operate and have access of 3D printing because they know the risk of 3D printing and they uh, are trained on how to protect themselves with a correct way. So in terms of equipment, is first to opt for material and equipment with lower emission. Different filaments will uh, produce different uh, emission. For example, <coughs> if we can compare PLA, ABS and nylon, uh, the PLA is more environmental friendly because it's uh, bio-based and it is, it is biodegradable. So for the last point, is place 3D printing equipment in the proper location. 3D printing machine should be uh, placed in a room that have a high airflow, and uh, operable window, uh, and has as house to the outdoors. Uh, the effective, effective way is to use HEPA ventilation. The easy way to visual HEPA is during uh, your primary school, Primary school, you have a, like, a fan that attached that to the wall. That is uh, a visualization of the HEPA ventilation uh, that can filter any emissions that are emitted during the 3D process in the, uh, from the indoor to the outdoor. Okay, I think that is all from my group. Thank you.